I'm Drew Stevenson. This is a lecture for my professional responsibility class about ABA model rule 1.8H, which is about malpractice waivers or settling legal malpractice actions with clients. So let's dive in. 1.8H1 is about limiting liability. Most law students are familiar with the idea of waivers of liability that people are asked to sign um, usually by uh, companies before they provide certain goods or services, uh, hold harmless agreements and things like that. Well, we really limit the ability of lawyers to ask for these from their clients up front. So H1 says a lawyer shall not make an agreement prospectively limiting the lawyer's liability to a client for malpractice. And then there's a big unless, unless the client is independently represented in making the agreement. So why would somebody have another lawyer? Well, I want you to think about uh, situations. Uh, if you have someone who uses a lawyer regularly for their transactional work, maybe corporate compliance work or contract review, and now they have litigation, they already have a relationship with the lawyer. So the litigator that they hire to handle their trial work, um, in theory, could ask for this. And if their usual transactional lawyer is willing to advise them about whether to agree to that, then it would be permissible. The same could be true for someone who ha has a trial lawyer and now the case is going to appeal. A lot of trial lawyers don't do appellate work and vice versa. So they, it's very common that if you do an appeal or appeal a case or the other side appeals a case, that you will have to get a different lawyer. And But you already have a lawyer from your trial. So if your appellate lawyer ask for a waiver of malpractice liability, as long as your trial lawyer is willing to consult and advise you about it. And uh, to be honest, it's probably a good idea for an appellate lawyer to ask for this so that you won't be sued um, for things that are, were really sort of um, fated to happen because of what happened at the trial. Uh, another situation that can come up, you may remember from our study of 1.7 is sometimes a conflict of interest will arise after the representation begins. And what one way to work around this is sometimes you can have another lawyer who will agree to take on one of the clients, basically babysit their file for a few months that if there's not a lot of action happening on the matter, um, it may be that you're able to resolve the conflict of interest with the other client quickly and then take back that client. Well, if you are asked as a lawyer to basically take over a client temporarily while someone else resolves a conflict of interest, it would be prudent for you to ask for a waiver of malpractice liability because you're not planning on doing any work on the case. You're babysitting a file in theory for a few months. And the um, the lawyer who's asking you to do this for the client may would be representing them still and could advise them about this agreement. So in all of those situations, it's conceivable that the client would have another lawyer. And then the final situation would be corporations who often have in-house counsel that could advise the corporate managers about whether to agree to malpractice waivers when they are outsourcing litigation to an outside lawyer. So let's go back to the rule. Let's go to 1.8 H2. A lawyer shall not settle a claim or potential claim for such liability with an unrepresented client or former client unless the person is advised in writing of the desirability of seeking and is given a reasonable opportunity to seek the advice of independent legal counsel in connection therewith. So again, if they have a lawyer, if they've gone and hired another lawyer to sue you, that's a, a different story. But if you realize in the middle of a, the representation that you made a mistake, you own up to it with the client, which you are required to do. It's a, a part of your duty of communication. And then the client then wants to sue you, let's say, or and you offered immediately to just settle the claim to um, the client's potential claim. Again, if they have a lawyer, it will be okay. If you're offering to settle a claim that has already kind of occurred, then you at least have to advise them in writing of the ad advisability or desirability of talking to another lawyer about it. Now, if they choose not to, that's on them. But for purposes of the test of the MPRE, make sure you watch for this. 
anytime a lawyer has to advise a client, put something in writing or get something in writing from a client, it's easy to turn that into a multiple choice question. So let's go back now and talk about the comments to this rule, which shed some further light on it. Comment 17 to rule 1.8 says, agreements prospectively limiting a lawyer's liability for malpractice are prohibited unless a client is independently represented in making the agreement, as we've already said. Now, Comment 17 also adds that this doesn't mean you can't have binding arbitration agreements in your in representation contracts with a client. Those are permissible. So it is permissible to make an agreement up front when at the time you undertake the representation to arbitrate any potential legal malpractice claims. Now, there's a whole body of law about arbitration agreements. And so whatever you are stipulating in this um, in this contract with the client at the beginning of the representation has to be enforceable under uh, the law. And uh, uh, as you would expect, the client has to be fully informed of the scope and the effect of the agreement. Now, we have another rule 1.2 about the scope uh, um, of a representation and allocation of authority. And that rule does allow lawyers to limit the scope of the representation and that, in effect, can limit your responsibility overall. In other words, if you are were really clear in your engagement, rep your representation agreement with the client that you were only going to do the trial or that you were only going to do transactional work and no litigation, then they can't really sue you for stuff that happens after that ends and or it's much harder for them to do that. And so in a sense, you can limit your responsibility and thus liability by limiting the scope within reason, right? So the definition of scope has, um, if it's making the obligations of representation illusory, will an amount to a, an attempt to limit liability. You're never allowed to ask a client to agree that you can provide negligent or half-hearted representation. That's tantamount to asking them to waive malpractice claims against you. So you can't say, look, I'll represent you, but I'm not going to try very hard or I'm not really going to do my best. Are you okay with that? That type of limitation on the scope of the representation is not uh, is not permitted. But if you're going to say, I'm only doing the appeal, if it, go, if it gets remanded for a new trial, I'm not doing your retrial, um, that is absolutely permitted. Go ahead and make that clear in writing so that when they're on their own, after your representation is done, they can't come back and sue you for ending the representation as you agreed up front. I hope you can see that it would be easy for misunderstandings about this to arise with the client and you should make it clear. Now, you may be wondering, how come so many law firms are LLCs or LLPs? These are, that's, these are limited liability entities. If you haven't taken corporations law yet, don't worry, I'm not going to go very far into this, except to say that they're allowed even though they do a limit so, to some extent um, how much a lawyer can be liable for, or at least for the um, for what goes wrong with other lawyers in the firm. So typically in these arrangements, lawyers will remain personally liable for acts or, or omissions, but we do the basic thing you need to remember for the test or um, at the MPRE is that LLCs and LLPs are permissible. And that concludes our lecture about 1.8H.